In Coast to Coast tonight, we're in pursuit of a railway dream. A rural lifeline that was cut long before Dr Beeching began to wield the axe. This is the main Carlisle to Newcastle railway. Here, just outside Hexham, at one time, another railway branched off across the River Tyne. Here ran the old Border Counties Railway, winding its way up into Scotland along routes once travelled by the Border Reavers. It was a social, sociable sort of railway. It never made any money, but it provided its string of isolated border communities with goods and a service from cradle to grave. Well, all that stopped in the 50s when it was declared redundant. What we wanted to do was to capture the spirit of the old Border Counties a spirit that remains in the memories of people who worked on the line and who lived by the line side. Our programme is a portrait of that somehow more mature age of the train. So join us, if you will, as we travel on a slow train to Rickerton. I'm just an old shepherd. I live out by. I never see naught but sheep in the sky. So I say to old Betsy, I think I will go and have a look at the Bellarmine show. Where will you say that, wife, if you've money to spare? It's a long time since you have been there. The lamb sell wheel and the bean lying low. So off you go to the Bellarmine show. Dear sir or madam, your notice in the Southern Reporter caught my eye and took me back a few years to the 1920s. The old North British line, Newcastle, Rickett and Hyke. My mother being a Hyke girl and we lived in Dunstan at the time, we travelled home quite frequently. Two old favourites used to pull the coaches, wandering Willie and Meg Medleys. It was like travelling with the village fair. Everybody appeared to know everybody else. The driver, the fireman, the guard, and the passengers all seemed to be at one. You could lower the carriage window and look to the rear of the train, and the guard would be receiving his bouquets and brickbats for what he'd brought or what he hadn't brought for the survival of the village shop. You can still see the station staff blowing out the paraffin lights as the train left. The folks who lived in the cottages near the line coming to their doors and waving to the train as it went by and the driver responding with a blast on the whistle. The last link with the outside world till early the next morning. In the winter, the cottage lights looked like stars in the blackness, all being days date as the train took certain bends or went into cuttings. Our date of this line was ever a commercial success, but it was a living line it was a lifeline. Yours sincerely, A. Fairley. Those wall, Holmeshoff, Charlton, Barrasford, Wark, Reedsmouth was the junction. Now you turn left, Tarset, Falstone, Placid, Thornyburn. Kielder, Soft Tree, Rickerton Junction. Now from there, you went right away up in the hike. Rickerton Junction, where the iron ghosts of Sir Walter Scott echoed off the hills. Dougal Dalgetty, Cuddy Hedrig, and Quinton Doward, railway characters all, in search of passengers who never arrived. There was a public inquiry held at the Royal Hotel, but we were beat before we started. And the reason why we were beat is because the same attitude was taken when the lines were put down as what is being taken by our colleagues in local government today. They bury their heads in the sand. The Newcastle Carlisle line how many stations is 
conveniently situated to the tones they're supposed to represent. Only two on the whole 60 miles. The reason was the landowners and the big house owners, including the Bates and the Cursops and the Bowmans, they all objected to the smoke of the steam engines. And they were successful because their pals was in Parliament. Then when the combustion engine come along, the railways were remote from the villages. And naturally, people could get the bus to the village instead of having to walk a mile or a mile and a half to the railway station. And this was the downfall of the rural district line. There's no doubt about it. It was unproductive. One's got to face that. It could never be made a productive line. The cars about when I first came here to, for transport, and it was all done by the railway and carts and horses leading from the station up uh, to the, the different big houses, you know, Chester's and Wallach Hall and Horton Castle and so on. <laughs> so that it was, uh, you know, a busy line that way. And, well, that was only Hamsaf. It was the boss, Wilson, the station master. <laughs> He's dead now. <laughs> I can tell you that much. But, uh, oh, he was a pretty hard man. The gentleman that Bob Wilson, that he's been on about, he was a character. He was a, a Scotsman. During the war, when we were uh, uh, standing at Humsoff, this summer's day, there was a weasel that had been in his hand run, and he got a, his shotgun, and he come running out. And he tripped over the line, and the shotgun went over the top of the, the engine. <laughs> My driver thought the invasion had started. <laughs> oh, he was a, a character, really. <laughs> he was very forthright, you know, and... and um, and that uh, nobody would sit on Mr. Wilson, really. <laughs> you know what I mean? He he um, had a great strength of character, and that. But he joined in all the village life here. He uh, started up a um, garden association, you know, and uh, uh, whist drives. He was a great man with the whist drives and that. <laughs> And uh, then he had a coal business there. We used to get our coal there, you know, the coal cells at the station. And uh, people round about all got the coal from there. When I used to get off the first train, 
He would be up at the bedroom window and count every passenger that got off, and if I had de as many tickets or excess fares as the bus passengers got off, you were for it. <laughs> but I was a hard man. Summer would bring the holiday makers to Holmes Half. Newcastle, I think, they would mostly come from the visitors who took the camping coach and had holidays and uh, enjoyed it, uh, really. Uh, I met several people who were in the um, camping coaches. They came from, uh, was it Walker Gate, some of them, and some was further afield, as I say. Ah, I'd never thought the railway would be done away with when we got killed or going, you see, that I thought they would keep it for transporting the trees and that, but it's all been done by road, apparently, uh, up to now, anyway. And I don't think we'll ever get a railway back. Smooth Junction was the border. Not the real border, you understand, but the place where the Scotch engine crews met the English, and where the village gossip of the country turned to the darker superstitions of the Moors and the Fells. Now, the Tabred disaster was 1876. The Tabred disaster. Now, what they did at low tide, they retrieved the engine in pieces, because it was all smashed to pieces, you see, axle, wheel, etc., etc. So they got the engine out of the tay, and the fitters reassembled it, you see, to its original state. Now, the Scottish drivers wouldn't drive it. They were superstitious, you see. Now, they called it the dipper, you see. Now, it was sent, the Reedsmouth engine said, it was resident there, in, in, in Reedsmouth engine said, you see for the English drivers to drive it. Now that was the story of the Dipper, the call of the Dipper. In them days when it was winter time, your back was freezing on them big engines. Oh, terrible. With no comfort whatever on them. No. no. Little engine like that, what's on the end of it? It ain't 312 in They were really cold. It was very uncomfortable with the fire and all because you had the fire off the top of the tender. There was uh, hardly any place you could fire up, up a bottom plate. And that was the idea. And uh, it was in such a state that uh, they didn't really enjoy them. I was walking the last passenger train from Hexham on a Saturday night to Kilgore. And of course, you could well imagine that once you leave Reedsmouth in Belgium with a paraffin lamp, it's just one blackout. So I had a lad fire to me, a nice lad, but he was rather nervous. And I didn't help it, because I used to say, now keep your head in, because the Red Indians is out up here. And I said, they might send one in, you never know. And just at the moment I said that, there was an owl flew in the engine cab, and the bloke flaked out. <laughs> <laughs> he got his feet burned on the boiler end, of course, the poor old. But I had the job reviving the fire, and that was Jody Parker. Was it indeed? That would be at Softree. Somewhere there's a railway there. Somewhere that would there. be at Softree, 1940, <laughs> where the engines were buried in. What well, they're trying to get so warm. That's the three engines at Softree. That's it. I was, uh, I was up there when those three engines, the, the, the army cooked those out.
Dad um, got a job as gamekeeper for the Duke of Northumberland, which um, meant that he moved to Patrick and settled in the little cottage which is now under the water. And that was 1909. And uh, they stayed there until um, after uh, the Duke died and his eldest son was killed at Dunkirk. And then the uh, Forestry Commission took the Kielder estate as part of the double death duties. And so um, they didn't need a gamekeeper anymore. Apart from walking, there was no other way of getting away from the village. Of course, there was only a certain distance you could walk. So um, everything, uh, uh, you know, wherever you went, you had to go by train. And uh, all the supplies and everything came into the village by the train. That is the main railway line, of course, and this is the little um, railway line that went up to the um, village. This was the, what we called the bank top, and then these two rows of houses were about another half mile down this little bogey line. They would be built when a little colliery would be in uh, working order. That is the shop up in the village, of course. That is the the bank top. So uh, the, this would be the um, uh, horse and the little bogies delivering coal to all the houses. Each house got a, a supply of coal, of course. The pits started to run down after the 1926 uh, general strike. And uh, uh, that was really the, it put an end to Plashets as a thriving community. People began to move away then. I started on the railway here as a boy porter when I was about 14 and a half years old. And then I was moved on to a relief job, a relief porter, and what meant, you know, you were relieving holidays. Well, it was a week's holiday people got in those days, and you were right down, you know, all the stations, right from Harriet down to practically Carlisle on the main line, all the branches, and right down the North Tyne, or the whole county's line as we knew it, right down to Hamshaf, and out the one back. For a sports cup, in fact, at times. And uh, I think by the time I'd finished, I'd worked at, a, you know, all these little level crossings and stations. I'd worked at over a hundred of them. Well, this 
this big house at the front here is the station master's house, and I was born right behind there in the, the house behind it, and uh, lived in that house all the time I was there. And this is the village hall along the end of this block, which is now been taken down, and it's down the road here and used as a contractor's shed. That one day we had the station master, county glyph clerks, and shunters, porters, the whole, everything got on the railway up there, and gradually everything disappeared. And of course, when the station master up there, he was station master, sub postmaster, librarian, he was automatically chairman of the whole committee. I think he looked after the little fire service for buying. <laughs> so, and as I say, he was gradually done away with, I was just left on my own at the finish. You know, when another went away, and as the families dwindled away, the, there was no necessity for the number of staff, and, and I was just left up there on the road. Of course, it right down the side of there. Right up the side there. And uh, used to be the siding there, the coals used to come in, uh -huh. the way bridge. You can hardly imagine it was all railways like it was here, eh? <laughs> Even the bridge over the... Aye, ah, the overhead pedestrian over bridge. bridge. Yeah. Old school still standing, though. No? Oh, yes. Then the house was just up there, with just number just 34, wasn't it? Aye. Uh -huh. the gardens out the garden in the front right there. right along the front, mm -hmm. Of course, if you'd been sitting here then, you wouldn't have seen them for the station building. The station, the station, the station building was up on the top of That's there. Right. the station. And you said there was just one house had the I think there was one house had the electric in. That was mine. And the chief clerk, was it? Chief clerk. Telegraph, go ahead. The electricity came in 1955. So then we used the tilly lamps, paraffin lamps, no television. Or anything like that. They brought a cooker in on a sledge, drawn by a horse. I was sitting on the horse's back and they were bringing it in, you know. I got a photo in the newspaper. I think I was 12 year old then. There was the village hall and they had the odd dances. And come from occasionally from Newcastleton and Softry and round about these places. You know, they, they would have to walk or cycle up the railway to get there, so it wasn't uh, overcrowded. No? Anybody coming here and never been here before, they wouldn't have an eye clue where all the lanes went. No. <laughs> no. Man, this would be the old no. castle dock, Campbell. No, aye, the old countess came in. <laughs> The signal right then, we didn't cut it down. We should have found for every time I climbed up. Climbed up. <laughs> that signal there. It's well grown up with weeds now. Right. Now, this would be the hub of it, Campbell. Yeah. Station office. Station office. That's where all the hustle there. and bustle went on. <laughs> hey? That's where all the hustle and bustle <laughs> went on. It's Stole. overhead bridge over there. Bridge came over it. Down off the hall bray. Ah, the hall bray, that's what they call it. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder they left the station master's house standing there. With the goats as station master now, I think. <laughs> I was yeah, say, it's a big change, that. Yeah. <laughs> station master getting buttied out to be a goat. <laughs> There's some good gardens, too. Aye. King gardeners as well. King, yeah. <laughs> Had much else to do, of course. Well, well. what do you say? <laughs> I think that's it, isn't it? The main line was didn't half blast when they went up from there, can't they? Oh, steamers. Steamers, there. And that's a western, some of those going up from there. Yeah, right. Eh? 
He had some sound going up from there now. Coal being shifted. Desolation now. Absolute desolation. It's a bit sad, really, to think that the, what the place was and the fun you had there, and now there's absolutely nothing, you know, apart from the school and the schoolhouse, which is still standing, the old station master's house, which is occupied by goats. And pretty sad, actually. The engine of those days, and the guards to a certain degree as well, you respected the people of the countryside. They were struggling to get to keep life in under extreme conditions. And we that was privileged to live in towns like Hexham realized that we could help these people a little bit. And therefore, we delivered the doctor's medicines. We delivered the newspapers. We collected the eggs and butter and brought them down. All these sort of things. And railway management knew. But they didn't quibble. They didn't quibble about it. It was an entirely different cohabitation between the people of the countryside and the people that run on the railways in those days. You helped one another, and what was the compensation? You got the traffic. You got the traffic. Mm -hmm.